Section twenty of Neighbourhood A Year's Life in and About an English Village by Tickner Edwards. Read by Peter Yearsley. October Part One. One. With each October in every year for a long time past, I have watched for the going of the Martins, but have never yet contrived to witness the moment of their flight. It has always happened in the same way. One day they have been as busy as ever about the roof eaves, their chattering song pervading the house unceasingly from dark to dark, and then a morning comes, generally towards the end of the first week in the month, when I awaken to a curious sense of strangeness and loss. First I mark the unwonted silence outside the windows, and then I guess what has come about. Looking forth, I see that the little mud houses, huddled together in a long row under the eaves, are deserted and silent at last. But today, though I missed the departure of the Martins, as usual, I was not wholly disappointed. Getting up in the new silence, and throwing the windows back, I looked along the roof edge. Save for the chippering and fluttering of a few sparrows, there was nothing to be seen or heard in the dim grey light, but it seemed the little army could have been away only a few minutes before me, for while I looked I saw the last of them depart. One single note of the remembered song broke out overhead. There was a whir of wings, and the little black and white bird lanced straight off, going due south unhesitatingly, as though the vanished throng of her companions was yet visible far away in the skies. It was a still grey morning. There had been no dew. Everything, as presently I went along by the woodside, was quite dry, and though it was barely eight o'clock, all the spiders in the bushes were hard at work weaving their snares. It was almost perfect spinning weather. On windy mornings, Though the webs must be made, the task is difficult and the work seldom properly carried out. But today there was only a vague air moving from the southwest, and all the spiders had got to work betimes, and with light hearts. The great charm in all nature study is to find out the truth for yourself at first hand. There are few things in my life I regret so keenly as the reading of nature books. This has robbed me of many a moment of pleasurable surprise, for to recognize a commonly accepted fact is poor substitute for its original discovery, although this discovery may have been made by others a thousand times before. Looking back over twenty years, poking and prying in the woods and fields round about Windlecombe, I rejoice not so much at the many things I have found out, but at the fact of so many things still unread of, and still remaining to be discovered. This morning, as I went along by the bushes in the lee of the wood, and saw the spiders at work, it suddenly occurred to me that I knew little or nothing about them, and the recognition of this ignorance came to me as truest bliss. I fell to looking on at the ingenious, complicated work, with almost as much anxiety and interest as the male spiders themselves. For it appears to be only the female who spins a web, the big-bodied spider so industriously occupied in every gap of the thicket, is always the female, though the male is never far off. You're sure to find him peering out from under one of the adjacent leaves, or treading timidly on the circumference of the web, trying to attract the attention, and thereafter perhaps the regard, of its maker. Spider nets and their weavers have, I think, never been given quite their place in the world of wonders. As far as human profit is concerned, spiders are useless things, and have therefore missed because from that standpoint they have not merited popular favour. But no doubt their ingenuity as craftswomen stands very nearly on a level with that of the worker honeybee. 
The waxen comb of the bee, whose perfection is due to the combined arts of engineer, mason, and geometrician, is very little superior in design and carrying out to the spider's web. On these still grey autumn mornings, the tendency of the eye is not to wander far afield, but to concern itself with the little things of the wayside close at hand, and so, more than at any other time of year, perhaps, the spiders and their ways come in for narrow scrutiny. And here is something, in the first loving investigation of which the uninformed, unread observer is much to be envied. He notices, in the outset, that these fine silken snares, hung by the spiders in the hedgerows, are of two kinds, the one placed vertically, across a gap in the surface of the thicket, the other placed horizontally, closing up some shaft or upward passageway in the heart of the green bush. The vertical net is seen to be composed of a number of threads radiating from a common centre, and upon these threads an ever-increasing spiral line has been laid, forming a regular meshed net. But the horizontal web has none of this geometric neatness. It is a mere expanse of fine tissue, irregularly woven into a sort of crazy pattern, and slung hammock fashion, completely closing the chimney-like hollow wherein it has been made. From a view of the finished webs, two other facts will be noted. The vertical net is supported only by lines springing from its circumference, and the spider sits at its centre in front. The horizontal net is suspended by numberless fine lines, attached at all points in its upper surface, while the spider clings to the underside as she lies in wait for her prey. But it is in the actual weaving of the nets that the interest of the onlooker will be chiefly centred. The maker of the vertical or cartwheel pattern of web begins operations in various ways, according to the conditions imposed upon her by the weather and the spot she has selected. Webs made in calm seasons, or when only light airs are stirring, will have few mainstays, and these may be of considerable length. But in windy times the spider will stretch her snare on only short hawsers, using as many as may be necessary to make assurance doubly sure. But in either case she will commence the work in much the same way. First she goes to the highest point on the windward side of her gap, and turning her head to the current, begins to pay out a line behind her. As this floats out, she continually tries it with her leg, until she knows that the end of the line has caught in the opposite twigs. Then she runs to the middle of this horizontal line, dragging after her another thread which she has previously attached to her original starting point. From the centre of the first line she lowers herself vertically, always dragging the second line in her rear, until she reaches a twig below. Here she draws her second line tight and fastens it, after which she climbs to the horizontal line and repeats the manoeuvre, only this time from its leeward end. Thus the triangle of mainstays, the first essential in all spider-web making, is complete. The weaving of the net within this triangular frame is the next work undertaken. The spider, when she first dropped from the centre of her uppermost thread, made a vertical line in descending. Some point on this line marks the centre of the future cartwheel pattern of web, and this central point the spider now finds unerringly, and begins to put in, one by one, the radiating spokes of the wheel. When all these spokes are in place, she returns to the centre, and, revolving her body quickly, she forms upon it a close spiral of four or five turns. This is to be her seat and watchtower, whence she will keep the whole web under observation. Having done this, she now, if the morning is at all breezy, carries temporary stay lines from spoke to spoke all round the web. These isolated circles of thread occurring at intervals of an inch or so between centre and circumference 
but on still mornings this part of her work is omitted as unnecessary, and she proceeds at once to the main spinning of the net. The construction of the cross-threads between the spokes of the web is always commenced at the extreme outer edges of the space to be filled, and the spider works inwardly, carrying the thread round and round from spoke to spoke, until she arrives within half an inch or so of the central small spiral. But the two are never joined. An interval is always left where the web consists of nothing but bare radiating lines. The snare is now finished. The spider takes up her station in the middle of the net, with no more to do for the rest of the day, but take what fair chance and her own crafty ingenuity may provide. Yet, having thus watched the making of a spider web from start to finish, and having noted all the details of construction here set down, there is something more about the matter which, if it escape the observer, will leave him in the rather disgraceful plight of having missed the most wonderful thing of all. The spider's snare is not woven throughout of the same kind of thread. Two kinds are used, and the difference between them is apparent even to eyes of very moderate power. While the triangle and the radiating lines are made of plain silk, the cross-threads are corrugated, and look like strings of tiny transparent beads. A touch of the finger will prove that these beads are really adhering drops of some glutinous fluid, whose use is not difficult to guess. But how do the beads get on the line, seeing that this, when first drawn from the spider's body, is visibly nothing but a plain filament of silk, like the rest of the web? The question has been asked many times, and the answer commonly given is, I have come to believe, an entirely erroneous one. We are told that the thread used for the crossbars in a spider's web when it first emerges from the creature's body, is only smeared, not beaded, with the gluten, but that after attaching each segment of the spiral to the spokes, the spider gives it a twang with her foot, thus causing the gluten to separate into beads. Here, then, is a fact, such as one would read in the nature books, and unquestionably accept but a little independent experiment with different glutinous substances reveals the fact that no amount of twanging will induce the latter to divide into beads such as one sees in the spider line. In every case, the tendency of the gluten in the experiment is to fly off altogether, or to gather to one side of the string but to any that desires to know the truth of the thing, the spider herself will speedily resolve the difficulty. Watch her at work, and it will soon be seen that the beads are formed on the line, not by twanging, but by stretching. At the moment each length of sticky thread is drawn from the spider's spinnerets, it is destitute of beads, but the spider quickly stretches it out, to nearly double its original length, and then as quickly slackens it, whereupon, before she has well had time to fasten the thread in its place, the beads will be seen to have formed themselves throughout its entire length. End of section 20 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.